Good morning and welcome to Awaken Life Church. I am so glad that you can join us. Today, I want to invite you to bring all your concerns, all your prayer requests before the throne of God. And you might say, but I've prayed for it before. Well, I'm inviting you to once again bring it at the feet of Jesus. And when we go through trials and tribulations and facing challenges, there is a tendency for us to feel worried and anxious. But there's a scripture that I want to read for you this morning that really speaks to our hearts in Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So today, wherever you are, identify your worries. Identify your prayer requests right now. And I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes while we bring these prayer requests before the Lord with thanksgiving and faith in our hearts that He is going to come through for each one of us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You that once again we can come before Your throne of grace with boldness, with faith, hope, and trust in our hearts. You see each heart today. You see each concern, each prayer request. Father, I bring each child of yours today with their worries, with their concerns, right now before your throne of grace. And I pray that you will embrace each and every one And that we will have faith in our hearts to rest in you and trust in you that you are going to answer, that you are going to come through for each one of us. We thank you and we praise you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Enter into the presence of God with thanksgiving in your heart, with gratitude, with praise, with trust, knowing that God is going to come through for you. Enjoy the service and be blessed. Ever be lifted 
Yes, Lord, we are your children. That is who we are. We find our identity in you. Father, I pray that you will open our eyes to see ourselves the way that you see us, to see the worth in us, the strength in us, the possibilities, the potential. So Father, I pray right now that we'll come before you, that we'll enter into your presence and say that we are your children. I pray, Lord, that we will strive to be the men and women that you have created us to be, to fulfill our purpose here on this earth, to share your love with the people around us, this life that you have given to us. Father, I thank you for the life that you have given to us. I thank you for the breath in our lungs, the beat in our heart. I pray that we won't take it for granted every day that we are given, that we'll make the most of our time And that when we get to see you face to face, you will tell us that we did a good job, that we ran our race well. So give us the strength, Lord, to do what you have called us to do. And may our lives glorify you every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Good morning. It's so good to be together again. As I've been saying this past Sunday, is the story of Jesus does not end with his death on the cross, not even with his burial and resurrection. We're going to start a series today looking at the work of Christ. And today we're going to look at his place as our Savior, the work he did and the work he accomplished on the cross as our Savior. We're reading John 19.30 that at the cross, Jesus cried, it is finished. Now, what was finished? And did his work end when he died? Now that he came back to life, is he still working or is it all finished? And he's just sitting in heaven waiting for his time to return. You see, our appreciation and understanding of our salvation will be greatly enhanced if we take time to consider this matter, the matter of the work of Christ. You see, the truth is that Jesus is still working. So let us take a look at the work He did and the work that He is doing and how it affects us. The work of Jesus is still in progress. Our salvation is still in progress. The process is not finished yet. And so, the more we understand about His work and how it affects us, the more we can appreciate our salvation and the more we can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Let us begin by looking at the work at the cross, the work that was done, the past work of Jesus. That is the work that Jesus accomplished in His life and through His death on the cross. Let us find out what He meant when He said, It is finished. On Good Friday, when I spoke about the seven words of the cross, I mentioned briefly some of the things that Jesus accomplished. Let us take a closer look at them. What work did Jesus finish on earth? Here are some of the things that Jesus came to do. He came to take away the sin of the world in John 1, 29. And John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came to save and to seek, to seek and to save what was lost. At the end of his visit to Zacchaeus, Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many, as stated in Mark 10, 45. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. He also came to save sinners, and, and that's a declaration by the Apostle Paul as he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And of course, Jesus came to take away our sins. 1 John 3.5 says, and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. The work of Christ on earth had been prophesied. Throughout the Old Testament, God announced beforehand the work of His Son. The most ancient prophecy happened just after the fall of man. God spoke to the serpent and said, Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. You see, as soon as they sinned, God was there seeking the lost. In this statement, he indicated his incarnation, her seed, he said. He spoke about his redeeming work on the cross when he said, you shall bruise his heel. And then his final victory over the enemy when he said, he shall bruise your head. At the time, it may have made no sense to the hearers or the readers of this statement. But today, looking back, we can see how this and many other prophecies have come to pass. As sin increased in the world after the fall, God brought judgments. However, the seed of sin in humanity kept pulling them back into sin. And so, God found a man of faith, Abraham, and through him he raised the nation of Israel. He gave laws to this nation and gave them the Levitical priesthood system through which sacrifices were made for the sins of the people. These sacrifices, they covered the sins of the people and positioned them to receive the blessings of God. Israel became a sign and a wonder to the Old Testament world. Whenever they obeyed the Lord and carried out His laws, things went well with them and their enemies could not get an upper hand. But... When they ignored God's laws and turned from His ways, their enemies overcame them easily. You see, sin has consequences. And God wanted His people to see the seriousness of sin as they sacrificed the animals to pay the price for their sins. Now, today we may look back at that system and it may seem outdated and, and cruel. But that is because... Today, humanity is embracing sin as a normal lifestyle. We say, ah, it's okay to do this, it's okay to do that, it's my life. But the truth is that sin causes damage. It causes damage to our emotions, to our minds, to our bodies, and to others that we hurt. It causes damage in this life, and more importantly, in the next life. So God has put laws in place for our protection. He loves us and does not want us to damage ourselves or others. And so His laws and their consequences and punishments are there for our protection. But the truth is that we cannot live without sinning. This was shown by Israel who, having a covenant with God and having seen His power demonstrated, continuously drifted away from his laws until Jerusalem was destroyed and the nation dispersed. But that whole system of sacrifices for the sins of the people, that was a shadow of what Jesus would do. Man could not save himself and the sacrifice of animals did not remove sin of men. It only covered it temporarily. An animal cannot pay the full price of sin. A sinner cannot pay the price for another sinner. Only a sinless one 
can pay the full price of sin. And so, the invisible God becomes a visible man. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. No one has seen God. In fact, the Bible says in Exodus 33:20 that no man shall see God's face and live. John 1:18 says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. And so Jesus came to show us what the Father is like. As one with the Father, Jesus could say, He who sees me has seen the Father. The attributes of God were made known by Jesus in incarnation. We see the holiness of God in His holy life, which He lived on earth to glorify the Father. Jesus displayed omniscience, knowing everything. He knew what was in people, and He knew their thoughts. He displayed the power of God in controlling the forces of nature, commanding the wind and the waves, turning water into wine. He had power over disease, over the demons, and over death. He revealed the love and the compassion of God. Do you notice that although he was a man, his life demonstrated the attributes of God? But by becoming man, not only did he make God known to us by showing us his attributes, but he also brought the word of God to man. Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2 says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. You see, Jesus confirmed the law and the prophets. He made reference to them and said that the prophets had written about Him. And by confirming the writings of the Old Testament, Jesus indicated that they were really inspired by the Holy Spirit, by God, and not just mere man's work. Jesus used the Old Testament that we use today, the same one. And although the New Testament was written after Jesus had gone to heaven, we believe that the church fathers were led by the Holy Spirit when they set the criteria for the books of the New Testament, you will find that there is no contradiction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But back to the work of Jesus bringing the Word of God to man. He also revealed the will of God, made known the Father and the fact of eternal life and the eternal and conscious punishment of the wicked. He predicted the great future events concerning Himself and His kingdom the end of the age, and His visible return. All this was the result of the incarnation of God becoming man. But there were things that the incarnation could not accomplish. You see, incarnation brought God to man, but could never bring man back to God. Incarnation could not make an end of sin. Read the Gospels. In spite of all that Jesus did, of all He demonstrated, sin continued around Him. People were still separated from God because of their sin. So much so that many turned against Jesus. The incarnation alone also could not make it possible for a righteous God to show mercy to the fallen and the lost in a righteous way. You see, sin had to be paid for. A sacrifice had to be made for the sin of the world. This great work of redemption could only be accomplished by His death on the cross. For this He had come. He came to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. The great purpose of the incarnation of the Son of God was His work of redemption. As we read earlier in 1 John 3, 5, He was manifested to take away our sins. A sacrifice had to be brought 
which would glorify a holy God and satisfy as well as exalt His righteousness. Peace had to be made. The sins of many had to be paid and the full penalty of them had to be borne. The author and prince of life came that he might give his life a ransom for many. The good shepherd appeared to give his life for the sheep. By his death alone, the great work of redemption could be accomplished. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 4 and 6 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. You see, the Old Testament sacrifices could not do it. But he says, you have prepared a body for me. That is the incarnation. That is God becoming man. That body was a prepared body, a holy body, an undefiled body, a body in which sin could not dwell and on which death had no claim. Hebrews 10 verse 9 and 10. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, he takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. <laughs> Jesus said, I came to do your will. And so he laid down his life once for all, one sacrifice for all humanity. No more sacrifices of animals needed. The death of Jesus satisfied the requirements of heavenly justice. Jesus, who was sinless, had to stand in the place of guilty sinners. All the waves of divine judgment and wrath had to pass over him. He drank the cup of the wrath to the last drop. You will remember that he refused to drink the wine mixed with myrrh because that was used as a sedative to ease the suffering of the condemned. But Jesus felt the full pain and the agony, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. The agony was so great that he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But Jesus endures to the end. And finally he shouts, it is finished. What was finished? The redemptive work on earth. The reason God had become man. The rent veil in the temple tells us it is finished. The open, empty tomb tells us it is finished. Yet, it is difficult to understand all that was accomplished by the sacrificial death of Jesus. As Paul said, now we see through a glass dimly. Only one day when we are in His presence, transformed into His image, when sin and death are no more and we are surrounded by His glory, then we will better understand what was accomplished on the cross. All we have and are and all we shall have and shall be as His people has its source on the cross of Christ, he died for all. He gave himself a ransom for all. He tasted death for every man. He is the propitiation for the whole world. In other words, Jesus brings peace between God and the world. This means his work is available to all sinners, to all who are on earth. Based on the fact that he died for all, the gospel is preached to lost and guilty sinners. Remember, 
the word says that all have sinned. Therefore, everyone needs the gospel. Christ died for the ungodly. Now, whosoever will, whosoever believes, this is the invitation of the gospel of grace because the work of the cross, all because of the work of the cross, no one is excluded. And all who believe in Him and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, for them He bore their sins on the cross. Each believing sinner can look back to the cross and can say, He loved me. He gave Himself for me. He paid my debt. He carried my sins in His own body on the tree. He stood in my place. He was my substitute. He tasted death for me. He is my Savior. Hallelujah. God is satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ. He paid the price for the whole world. But this does not mean that the whole world will be saved. The word says that he bore the sins of many, not the sins of all. And this is so sad. He was the substitute on the cross only for those who believe in Him. And those who believe in Him, they have peace with God. Jesus is our peace. We have perfect acceptance and standing before God. With no more conscience of sin, we can stand in God's presence. He has put an end to the old man. We are dead to the world, to self, to sin, to the law. The old man was crucified with Christ. We have salvation. We are saved, secure as children of God, heirs of God, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and much more, all because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. It is finished. But the work of Jesus did not end. His work is still in progress, and our salvation is still in progress. So please join us next Sunday as we talk about the work that Jesus is doing now. Amen. As we close, let me ask you to consider the following. We have heard today that Jesus paid the price for the whole world, but that does not mean the whole world will be saved. Tell me, are you a sympathizer of Jesus? Or are you a Jesus follower? The invitation of Christ is to follow Him. That is, believe in Him, put your trust in Him, and begin to follow His ways. A follower is not just one who gives mental assent to the fact that Jesus existed, but one who embraces His teachings and endeavors to follow them and practice them. The process of salvation begins with surrender. You believe that Jesus died for our sins, that He was buried, and that He rose on the third day. Because you believe that He's alive, you put your trust in Him and in what He taught. And you take it seriously. You learn it and you do it. If you are already a follower of Jesus, I hope this message has helped you see in a greater way the beauty of the incarnation as well as the great suffering at the cross that was required for our salvation. If you have not surrendered to Jesus yet, what is stopping you from doing so today? A simple prayer from your heart is all it takes. The work is finished. All you have to do is take a decision to accept that work, believe in the Lord Jesus, and begin your journey with Him. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, as we ponder again on the work that you have done, the work that you finished on the cross. Lord, we cannot but stand back in awe and just be so full of gratitude, Lord, 
for everything that you have accomplished for us. Even though we cannot fully understand today, we cannot fully comprehend, Lord, what are the eternal riches of our faith in you, of the work that you finished on that cross. But Lord, we thank you. And I pray, Father, that if there is anyone still today undecided, Lord, that right now you'll speak to their hearts, that they'll cry out and say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe you died for sinners. You died for me. You were buried. You rose on the third day. And I submit my life to you. Help me to follow you, to do your will. And a simple prayer like that can get you going in that life with Jesus. I thank you, Father. Help those that are already on the way, Lord God, that are following you. Help us to stay faithful and to get a clearer understanding of your work, to grow in faith. For your glory, I pray, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Enjoy your Sunday further. We'll see you next week as we continue the study on the work of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.